House of the Dragon and Rings of Power. Both are two recently released fantasy shows. Both of them are very different in tone and style. One of them, in my humble opinion, is far superior to the other one. I'm going to be taking a writing look at these two shows, examine the writing put into both, and decide which one is written better. I could go in depth about all the nerdy story stuff uh, surrounding each of these properties, but I'm going to leave that to other people on the internet who have vastly more knowledge in these areas. I'm going to be taking a completely unbiased look at these two shows from a completely technical writing standpoint. Now, we'll get started first of all with Rings of Power, because I saw it recently, and by recently I mean last night. I watched the first episode, and so for this video I am only going to be critiquing the first episode of each show. I'm not going to go into the second from House of the Dragon, even though I've seen both. We start off, first of all, in this scene with young Galadriel, when she's a little girl, and she's being bullied by the elves, the other elf children, and her brother comes in and, I guess, stops her from beating the shit out of all the other children. And then he delivers this questionable metaphor. Do you know why a ship floats and a stone cannot? Because the stone sees only downward. So why is that metaphor questionable from a writing standpoint? He compares a rock to a boat. So in your brain, I've never once compared a rock to a boat unless I was talking about sinking and buoyancy. Now in the first time he brings up this metaphor, he's not talking about that. He's talking about the rock looking into the water and being dragged down by the darkness, whereas the boat looks up into the sky and is guided by a star which is slightly strange because later on in the episode he brings up that metaphor again in kind of a you know mental remembering thing in Galadriel's mind and it's switched do you know why a ship floats and a stone cannot so now the metaphor is a rock sinks and a boat floats which is what would actually work with that metaphor. First time he brings it up though, it's incredibly convoluted and it's not necessarily clear what he's trying to indicate unless you take a moment to examine it in depth. And even then, to be completely honest, it doesn't make that much sense anyway. A lot of the characters in Rings of Power speak in metaphor, especially the elves. They use similes to describe things in dialogue. It's almost as if the writers were trying to sound highfalutin and more intelligent uh, and try to give the elves this very metaphorical, lyrical dialogue that unfortunately doesn't come across very well. It is said the wine of victory is sweetest for those in whose bitter trials it has fermented. He will linger here, an outcast, poisoned in dark whispers and dreams. My song would mock the cries of battle in my ears. Only in the blessed realm can that which is broken in you be healed. If but a whisper of a rumor of the threat you perceive proves true, I will not rest until it is put right. You know, if you look at the elves from Peter Jackson's movies, which, by the way, I'm a little biased, towards because I believe they're the best films ever made, the best story ever adapted. You see the elves speak in a certain way that's slightly different than the other races. They're not, you know, kind of dragging on their sentences longer and longer and filling them with all these metaphors and sayings and riddles and things. It's just, it seems a little bit, uh, convoluted really is the best way to describe it. After that we move on to the prologue scene which was promised quite a bit in, in initial uh, teaser material and whatnot. I'm not gonna lie a lot of 
the images and the visual aspects of this are pretty solid. You know, throughout the whole show, you can tell they spent a lot of money with a certain style in mind. It just seems to fall a little bit into the territory of CGI overload at many more points than is required. You know, when you think of Peter Jackson's movies again, um, it's shot in New Zealand and you see the landscape because they chose it specifically for that reason. You know, they have Rohan built on the hill in the second film and they built that on that hill and they just kind of CGI'd in a couple more, you know, the lower part of the village and whatever on the hill, but you see that as the actors saw that. And that's a good thing with House of the Dragon that I'll get into later on, where everything is labored over. Whether things were labored over in Rings of Power, as an audience member without any background information, I can't tell. That's getting a little more into the filmmaking side, but, you know, when you're thinking about this prologue, you have this scene where Galadriel is stacking this pile of helmets. Why is she doing that? You know, if you think, if you take out all the glitz and all the music and the imagery and think about what's happening, why is she stacking helmets? You know, if you're in a medieval battle, that has, you know, a, a, the aftermath of a medieval battle, and you have a bunch of dead bodies with armor on, you're going to collect all of that and not pile it up. You're going to collect it and either melt it down or repurpose it or give it to more soldiers. I mean, stuff costs money. Piling things up is just, you know, it, it kind of reeks of, oh, this looks cool, it doesn't make sense, but we'll put it in anyway. You get a shot of Sauron, that looks quite cool. It doesn't really have any bearing on much of whatever else is going on. Then you see this this scene with Galadriel taking the dagger of her fallen brother. Sauron has carved this mark into her brother's body. Will this be explained why he did that? I don't know. I don't know if I would hold out hope that they will. Um, but but why would he do that? Why would he carve this strange symbol into his body? Is he trying to lead the elves to him? Is he trying to give them a hint as to where he is or what he's planning? Why is the mark carved into his body? Then we see them climbing this wall of ice, which, by the way, looks a little bit like climbing the wall of ice in Game of Thrones. You have this situation where they reach the top of the mountain and Galadriel puts her sword into the ice and she takes out a dagger and points towards the map so that the audience can tell what she's looking at. Probably the director's decision to do that um, if it was not written in the script, but it's fluff. It's why is she pulling out a map and pointing a dagger at it? She would know what she's looking at, right? You know, then this elf dude... Uh, comes to her and says, we should basically, uh, we've been looking for a long time, we've overstepped what the king wanted us to look for, we should return. Perhaps we would be wise to camp here, and tomorrow begin the journey home. Um, which is nice, except why didn't he say that before they climbed the mountain? He expend all that effort to climb the mountain to rest at the top and then say, hey, we should go back down the mountain at dawn and go home. Why not bring this up before you climb the mountain? This might seem like I'm nitpicking, and I might be. From a logical standpoint, from a character standpoint, whenever you're writing something, and whenever I write something, I have to think, if I were this person, and I had the motivation that I had, whatever it might be, when, when would I bring something like that up? Why would I bring it up? You know, why would I choose to do it at this point instead of this point? You know, you could argue that maybe he was trying to summon the courage to speak to her about this. Um, but even then, if I was about to come up to a wall of ice that she wanted me to climb, 
I would think, oh, well, now or never, bitches, you know, I need to tell her that I'm not comfortable. I want to go home. We're disobeying the king, right? When your audience is watching or reading, they will pick it up and they will think, that's strange. Why did he do that instead of this more logical thing that makes a lot more sense? Um, no. <laughs> I don't care how strong an elf is supposed to be. I don't care how strong Galadriel is supposed to be. She cannot punch a solid wall of ice and crumble it in two hits. And then in this next scene, she says, bring it down. And then it's just like, boop. It's like, it, it's, like it's crumbled, disintegrated. How did they do that? There's no battering rams. There's no pickaxes with them. How did they break the wall? The amount of times that lines in this show are pulled from Peter Jackson's trilogy is mind-blowing. What devilry is this? What is this new devilry? She has passed beyond my sight. Frodo has passed beyond my sight. If you're trying to differentiate from Peter Jackson's trilogy, why are you doing that? The subtle and, you know, tactful way to do that is not by pulling lines from the original work and just having random characters say them. Then we come to the scene that made me, you know, kind of switched me off immediately. There's this ice troll that comes and he's, you know, destroying these elves. He's picking them up and dashing them against the wall and you know this group of armored fully grown elves with swords and weapons cannot take on this troll and so Galadriel you know first of all jumps on a sword and then kills this troll in maybe 30 seconds if you're thinking from a logical standpoint or a realistic standpoint that's complete bullshit. <laughs> How is she killing a troll in 30 seconds, if that, when this huge, not huge, but this full group of armored elves, warriors, cannot even touch it, can't come near it? Now, of course, after that happens, the men, or the elves, uh pull out their swords and they say we are not going with you and they set their swords and their bows down on the ground and if they're going home don't they need them you know i get the metaphor of they're setting down their weapons and they don't want to fight anymore they don't want to follow her they set the weapons down but if they're going home don't they need them do they pick them up again you know, it's not clear whether they... Because it seems in the way that the show is structured that Galadriel goes back with them. Um, because then you, we find her in... I don't remember the name of the elf city where Gilgalad is the king and Elrond is, but, you know, we find her there next. So that seems to insinuate that she goes back with them. Do they pick the swords up? I assume they do, but you're not saying it why have it at all if it's gonna seat some confusion in the viewer's head then we come to the harfoots who are not hobbits except they are hobbits but they're not the next major problem with this show that it completely suffers from there's a writing watchword and i'm sure you've heard it show don't tell you know, whenever we talk about Nori Brandyfoot, who's the basically female Frodo, you know, these characters are saying, oh, she's so troublesome. Oh, she's so this, she's so that. But the winds are still out there. They be fine, Goldie. Nori's with them. You know Nori. Yes, I do. A tongue lashing, if you don't mind your own cartwheels. What is it? What do you see up there? Eleanor Brandyfoot, with your father's nose and always poking it into trouble. You are far too curious and meddlesome to have been born a Harford. Are you quite certain you're not part squirrel? They sometimes even tell it to her face. Oh, she's so this, you're so this. This is a perfect example, because a lot of people don't understand show, don't tell, because it, it can be quite 
you know, weird to wrap your head around. This is a perfect example of it, what not to do. Instead of showing you that she's troublesome, which they do, you know, she leads the people into the, into the little berry garden and whatever. Instead of showing you just that with nothing before it, it tells you multiple times over and over again that she's troublesome. But I can figure that out as a viewer when she leads her little pack of people into the berry garden and almost gets eaten by the wolf or whatever, even though it's not really much of a danger. You know, and then she goes back and maybe her parents scold her for it and whatever. And then I, as an audience member, can insinuate that she's troublesome because she did that. You know, it's not, you know, when you treat the audience as dumb, where you need to explain everything to them multiple times over, you end up, you know, most people, well, I say most, but a lot of people who watch this show seem to say that it was boring. There are a lot of reviews say it's boring, it drags on, there's nothing happening. Well, why are they saying that? Because it, it the show is telling you everything. The pacing of the show and the cutting of the show is very disjointed and slow in and of itself. But then on top of that, when it tells you everything, instead of letting your brain figure stuff out for itself, you have, you're basically sitting there idle, not doing anything, right? You know, when I get onto House of the Dragon, I'm going to show how House of the Dragon is slow. And people have criticized it for being slow. But it doesn't tell you what to think. It doesn't tell you what's happening. At some points, it, it verges on doing it. But most of the time, the dialogue between the characters, the nonverbal looks that they give each other, that's enough to tell the audience what's happening without blatantly expressing it. Now, I think I'll talk about something that uh, people have criticized and one of the main criticisms of this show is that Galadriel is, is not a likable protagonist. You know, aside from all the, you know, stuff about, oh, a woman and whatever, whenever you're writing a protagonist, whoever they are, whether they're a man, a woman, a horse, a tree, your protagonist has to be a protagonist. Number one thing that I've personally found with, with writing, if you want a character to appear heroic, they're selfless. Selfless is number one word. Uh, Frodo, who is the protagonist, he is taking on this task that was not assigned to him, but kind of fell into his lap. And he knows he'll die. You know, at, 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 in the Return of the King, he starts to realize he's going to die at the end of this. But he does it anyway, puts the lives of other people and the safety of other people in the world before himself. Now, what is the difference between Galadriel and Frodo as a protagonist? Galadriel is not selfless at least in this first episode that I've seen. She is strong-headed. She is belligerent. She's, she's quite rude to people at certain times. And she's not selfless. There's the, the writers have not set up a situation for her to be selfless. They've not set up a situation for her to be a hero. They've set up a character who's focused entirely on vengeance without cause. You know, Sauron killed her brother. That's nice. But it, is it enough motivation to give a protagonist? That's, that's motivation for a side character, but it's not for a protagonist because it's not very complex. You know, she's going to spend the entire time, and she does, talking about how she can't do this, she has to do this, has to do this, because she wants vengeance for the death of her brother. When other people come to her and tell her things, she doesn't listen to them. I mean, we move on to the scene with Erendir. He's the elf 
that I guess is is stationed over this town uh, and there's these people in this town who are supposedly descended from people who fought with Morgoth during you know whatever age or whatever year it was uh, he comes into a, a tavern or an inn and he gets accosted by some patron uh, because of how he looks and what day was he here? Oh, let it go, knife ears. It's a bloody patch of grass. You don't give the orders around here, <laughs> you mutant son of a bitch. Little bit like The Witcher. Um, same kind of lighting, same color palette, same general idea of what's going on. Um, I'm going to be honest, the actual storyline this subplot between Erendir and Bronwyn who's the human woman that he falls in love with I don't really care you know I think it stems from the fact that I don't know who these people are I don't know why they love each other aside from the fact that they do um you know when you look at uh, Lord of the Rings this is probably supposed to be a reflection of Aragorn and Arwen. And with that one, you knew who Aragorn was because he'd been introduced before Arwen was brought in. So you connected with him already and you saw what kind of person he was. And then you bring in Arwen and she is introduced and she has to take Frodo to Rivendell on the horse and gets chased by the ring race and you've seen the movie. The difference between that is that you know who these characters are. It was more relatable. It was more touching. It was more, you know, it felt like these characters were in love for a reason. Even if, you know, a casual watcher of the movie wouldn't really know what the reason was. During this scene in the, in the bar, uh, this the guy who's accosting him says, you guys have been... Uh, watching over us or suppressing us, whatever, because you think that we are descended from Morgoth. And then you have this scene later on where Erendir goes to this watchtower, and this happens. And you believe this place was once a barren scrap of rock? The blood of those who stood with Morgoth still darkens their veins. But for 79 years you've kept watch over the men and women of Tiharad, not because of what their ancestors once did but because of who they still are. They're trying to frame the guy in the bar as being wrong, and he is, but the elves are not exactly good either in this situation. You know, if the elves are treating these humans as if they're scum that are descended from people who fought with Morgoth, I'm not too surprised that he's angry at them. Um, I just want to note that there's a lot of assholes in this show and not a lot of really relatable respectable characters you know this is a a complaint of modern hollywood where all the men are either useless or arrogant pricks i'm not seeing a lot in this show to contradict that elrond seems pretty pathetic um he's not really doing anything um, you know, a lot of the elves are kind of, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to fight with you. We want to go home. And then when the cave troll comes out or the ice troll, they can't fight it. And Galadriel has to come in and save them. Uh, a lot of the humans seem to be quite vile. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a strange way to write something. It's a strange way to write, uh, a world where, uh, you know, everyone's a dick, and there's not really... Even Galadriel's a dick to people. So who who am I supposed to connect with as an audience member to say that is a hero? You know, that is the person that I identify with. That's the person that I look up to. You know, I could say that I look up to Aragorn in the original films because he's an honorable person, you know, he's framed as this warrior and very honorable, respectable warrior. He, you know, he's devoted to Arwen. Uh, 
you know, it's everything that a, you know, I guess an ideal man should be for lack of a better way to describe that. But I think it's quite accurate to describe it like that. You get the scene where the elves are on the boat and they're going towards Valinor and the clouds open up. Um, and I just want to give credit to whoever the visual effects team was on this scene because the clouds opening up and the the music and the sound effects and everything, it, uh, you know, from a production standpoint, you know, quite ominous and, and um, you know, beautifully horrifying of an image to see. That's, of course, ruined shortly afterward by the infamous scene where Galadriel jumps off the boat into the ocean, in the middle of the ocean. You know, I, I can understand where they were coming from with it, but it was not executed very well at all. You know, if she's in the middle of the ocean and she jumps off this boat, what's her plan? This is a situation where the writers wrote her into a into a corner and couldn't get her out by any logical turn of events, right? So, you know, when you're writing a character in a situation that's inescapable, typically a writer, writer will use a deus ex machina, which is a writing term. You've probably heard it before if you've, you know, been writing for a while. It's where something swoops in from out of nowhere and saves the character. This is not even a deus ex machina yet. This is just a dumb decision. You, If I were to fix this, I would say maybe she passes into Valinor. She goes through. And then you have some sequence of her trying her best to live in this in this new environment and she just can't and so she has to find a way back through into middle earth to continue what she was you know trying to do to get vengeance you know just having her jump off the boat it's like she's going to die she can't there's hundreds of miles theoretically between this point in the ocean and any stretch of land so as a writer what what's your plan you can only use a deus ex machina to get out of that situation and i know that they do though i haven't seen it in person yet um but it's just it just seems it comes across as a bit lazy um so overall my my impressions of the show uh rings of power it started off okay i thought it had some potential and then it just took a steep, steep dive. And it's unfortunate. Um, you know, the Wheel of Time, when that show came out, it seemed it's, it's the same situation. I mean, it's Amazon doing it. So Amazon seems to have whatever problem Amazon has, it's consistent and they need to ad address it. Um, but those are certainly the things that I noticed from, you know, th through the eyes of someone who is a writer. Um, you know, as I said, I could address all of the lore breaking and the changes from the source material that they made, um, but there's plenty of people on YouTube and on the internet that you can watch if you want to see, uh, you know, more of that kind of thing. Um, the writing was, you know, dare I say awful. The dialogue was pretty pathetic. Um, there weren't any moments where I was intrigued or drawn in because it was just telling me everything, you know, from start to finish. It was just telling me what to think, what was going on. It was, it was, you know, it was bad. <laughs> um, the things that I liked, because I don't want to just dump on it, uh, the visuals were unique. There was certainly stylized. A lot of the costumes were pretty dumb looking. Um, but a lot of the, but, but some of the costumes looked pretty okay. Um, the armor that the elves wear when they're being sent off on the boat, taking into account that it looks like it's made of cardboard, the actual design of it is kind of interesting. I wasn't drawn in. I wasn't stimulated by it in any way. 
Um, so now I think we're going to look at House of the Dragon, which is, in case you couldn't tell, it's definitely the one out of the two that I liked better. Now, why did I like it better? Well, first of all, it starts off, we get something that looks a little more grounded. The costumes are a lot better made. There's more detail put into them. Um, you know, you you start off a lot differently than the Rings of Power starts off. And granted, the Rings of Power is kind of something that's a bit grander in scale, and they try to portray that. But House of the Dragon is just so much more skillful. Um, I think it's also maybe important to discuss the protagonists of each of each show. So, you know, we can look at the different aspects and the character profiles of Galadriel and then of Rhaenyra Targaryen, who in my opinion is a much better protagonist. If we're going to start off with this, so Galadriel, right from the beginning, and this is something that you should avoid when you're writing, it's so important and Hollywood doesn't See, it's they've forgotten this is that hero's journey you know way of writing something the the conflict arc the story arc you have the the beginning you have the exposition you have the rising action the climax the the falling action and the denouement and i made a whole video on this you do that with a character arc you have the character start off as one thing status quo move into the rising action and the change of the character you know you hit certain points on this arc that the character needs to hit in order to be changed in some way by the end of the story and then once you reach the end of the story the character is supposed to be improved in some way you know if we're looking at uh lord of the rings just because that's on on the brain right now well well let's use aragorn because he's more of a kind of obvious answer to this he starts off as a ranger he doesn't want to be king he doesn't want the throne even though that's his destiny he's the heir to the throne of gondor over the course of the films and the book he comes to accept that and he comes to you know n maybe not want it but accept that it's his duty and that it's for the benefit of the realm and for his people. And so you can always tell when you look at good character arcs, a picture from the beginning and a picture from the end. How different will those pictures be? In the beginning, you have Aragorn sitting in the prancing pony in the corner smoking his pipe. He's cloaked, he's dirty. At the end, you have him in his armor with his crown and he's the king of gondor that's a character arc when we see galadriel in the lord of the ring in the rings of power excuse me she starts off completely powerful there's nothing about her that's flawed in any way there's no you know you, you can't really argue that her vengeance is a flaw because that's her motivation and maybe her flaw is that she's too strong-headed about that and she can't focus on anything else. But then, you know, the show so far hasn't really portrayed that as a flaw. They've portrayed it as an aspect that's maybe good. You know, you look at Rhaenyra Targaryen from House of the Dragon. She starts off, she's a bit boyish. She's a tomboy, clearly. They portray that pretty obviously. Um, she's riding her dragon around. Her father, you know doesn't really want her to do that he wants her to be more he wants her to grow up is the sense that i'm getting and she's she kind of over the course of these episodes and i'm sure the series she has to grow up and she has to become the queen or the heir that she has been made you know, that her father has made her um you get the scene in in Rhaenyra's mother's chamber. I don't remember her mother's name. Um, 
and it's you know the the theme of the show is this patriarchal thing and the woman can never sit the throne and you know people were worried that they would be really heavy-handed with that and not subtle i think in the first episode they're a lot more heavy-handed with it than they are in the second but because i'm only judging the first i have to judge that i think this scene here is a little heavy-handed with it i think they're 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 you know hammering it home a little heavy you know the the that theme is fine because in medieval you know this is based on medieval england so in medieval england that's how it was you know there were certain reasons why a queen would not be preferred um you know one that i can think of or that i've read is that when a queen is is crowned she has to give birth because she needs to continue the line to have an heir to the throne so while she is pregnant she is basically dealing with the pregnancy and she can't you know in their view the she is not really focused too much on her duties as queen she's focused on the baby which whether or not that's true is is you know arguable but the idea in that time period was that the man if he's a king he can have an heir and his wife is dealing with the baby while he's being king it seems it's it's a it's a subtle uh point of story to deal with it's a subtle point in history to deal with and i think house of the dragon at least so far is kind of dealing with that in a subtle way certainly a lot more subtle than rings of power deals with certain topics you know disguising things as other things and making you think about those things a different way based on how they're presented instead of just hammering you in the face with them um and i think so far house of the dragon is pretty you know it's it's tiptoeing in some scenes but it's it's mastering that subtlety of those topics in a pretty you know agreeable way i mean when you when you look at the dialogue in house of the dragon and i i spoke of this a few you know minutes ago it's subtle it's quick it's snappy and it tells you what you need to know so in scenes like the you know the small council meetings you see this interplay between the characters you see um you know nonverbal to convey something you see here's here's an a, here's a list a quick list of all the times that i found that house of the dragon played with show don't tell and did it correctly it will beggar our ports the crown has heard your report lord corlys and takes it under advisement the cost of the tournament is not negligible perhaps we might delay until the child is in hand <laughs> son of the hand of the king having your favor would all but assure it now compare that to rings of power and it's on another planet um the writing of house of the dragon is so far superior in my opinion two rings of power just based on that because they have a mastery of dialogue and television is all about dialogue because you can't get internal thought monologues like you can in a book so it's all about subtlety especially when writing dialogue and this is important to know dialogue delivers information subtext is important what a character means versus what they're saying that is an incredibly important thing to pay attention to carry on you were saying something about my impunity 
You might not know this unless you left the safety of the Red Keep, but much of King's Landing is seen by the small folk as lawless and terrifying. I just hope you don't have to maim half of my city to achieve this. Time will tell. Um, if I'm going to maybe give some criticism for House of the Dragon, I think there's a scene where there's a joust that takes place. And what happens is all the knights start bashing each other's heads in and killing each other, which is a little bit weird because in that little span of time, how many wars were just started if this was actually true? You know, these are the highborn knights, highborn sons of these lords, and they're being entered into this tournament. Are they going to be beating the shit out of each other to death? That It might have been sacrificed for the sake of something bloody and violent, um, which I don't think was a good idea. I think the joust, the violence of the joust in and of itself, from a writing standpoint, I've said that a lot this video, from a writing standpoint, the violence and action of the joust is good enough. It can be portrayed as violent, but not to the point where they're killing each other, because then you're stepping past what is realistic. Um, so on a final note, if I were to, you know, rate House of the Dragon, um, I would give it an 8 or a 9 so far in, in regards to keeping my interest because in contrast with Rings of Power, House of the Dragon was slow, but I didn't mind that it was slow because I was interested by what was happening. Whereas with Rings of Power, it was slow and I found myself wishing it was over. You know, at, whenever something would happen, some new thing would be introduced, I'd think, oh, you know, can we speed up? When the audience wants your show to be over, you're not writing it properly. I'm sure some people have watched House of the Dragon and they think it's slow and boring. And that that's a fair, you know, assessment to make of it. You know, when it comes down to writing, comprehension on the part of the writer, um, you know, understanding what the story is and what the stakes are and why things are important. It's it's just miles ahead, House of the Dragon is, miles ahead of of Rings of Power. If I were to give a final note, um, watch both, see what you think. Um, because I'm only one guy, I have my opinions, I have my perspective, but I'm not you. And so what I think could be different than what you think. And so on that note, you know, leave your comments down below if you agree with some of the points I made or you disagree with some of the points I made. Tell me why. Um, I would love to hear different perspectives on these two things. Tell me what you noticed that I missed. Um, if you want to add to something or bolster something that I said, feel free to do that as well. And, you know, at the end of the day, from my perspective, I am bloody happy that we are getting House of the Dragon because so far, and granted, they could screw it up. They could, you know, take a nosedive at some point along the way. But from what I can tell, it seems like it's going to be a great show, a great successor to Game of Thrones. Uh, not everyone will agree with that. I know that's a very contentious opinion to have. But in this, you know, sphere of entertainment that we're living in right now, having something like House of the Dragon is a breath of fresh air. And I'm so happy that it is being made.